co-founder of Jaiko and I've been an entrepreneur since uh, 97 when I founded my first company called First Hop. Hop. And I've uh, founded five companies, three of them are still operational and doing pretty well. And then Jaiko was acquired and First Hop was acquired by AOI, which is a US telecommunication software company. Uh, and nowadays I'm at Lifeline Ventures, so we're doing very early stage investments. We have eight or nine, depending on a few phone calls, eight or nine investments uh, on, on health and web. So, um, and, 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 and uh, examples range from Onkos Therapeutics, which is a uh, a biotech company developing a, a virus-based therapy for cancer to Applifier, which is a cross-promotion network for Facebook and, and I guess our latest or second latest investment. So we have investments from, from, from all over. And we all ex-entrepreneurs, like serial entrepreneurs, if you say so. Uh, we invest very little money a lot of time and probably uh, more money in the future so when we have more funds funds available so that's that's my my background so i've been in quite a few cases where we have companies have been i've sold companies and i've been advising in cases where other people have sold companies and and at google i was involved in a few acquisition projects together with the corporate development people and I worked at Google's business development uh, new business development department which is like a SWAT team at Google doing all kinds of non-standard stuff like all the partnership deals that are not standard are done by the new business development team so like my things ranged from renegotiating SMS aggregation deals in Africa to uh, Android developer outreach in Europe, so they were really different kind of things. So I, I, I learned a lot because that was the first big company I worked for, so it was very interesting to see it from inside. But that's that's my All right. background. Thank you, see. All right. Um, compared with the people here, you guys are old. Yeah. So my question <laughs> for you is, I mean, being here, um, you must have an interesting perspective on on uh, the startup scene here in Finland. So can you tell us how you know it was before and, and how it's different from now? So before, if I go like before, like, like five years ago. before them was even born, oh, wow. like <laughs> yeah. late nineties. No, let's go Jaiko time. <laughs> yeah, so Jaiko time. I mean, I think Jaiko time was kind of a. It, it was very quiet time in Finland. Like Finland was really lagging in the whole web. 2.0 scene, like nothing was happening here. Uh, so I, I'd like to go a bit further, like in in the in the change of the millennium, like the late 90s, early zero. So how do you say? <laughs> the I mean, then the the scene was pretty interesting. Like that, that was the first wave of startups where people who didn't have any experience just found it founded companies and we didn't have any venture backed companies before that phase. Like we had F Secure and Stonesoft and Comptel and these kind of companies that were successful but not venture backed companies. So that was an interesting phase. For some reason we were starting a lot of startups were created and some of them still live and and, and some of them have been acquired like hybrid and and and, and others. So but then, it, 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 for some reason, like when in, in, in the crash in 2001, 2002 crash, like really made, after that the startup scene was really quiet. And I, I don't know why, but like Finland pretty much lost the whole Facebook wave and, and Web 2.0, there were just a few companies and so on. But now, like the situ situation is much better oh. now. I mean, there, there's more like, how would you call this, like grassroots things happening. And Alto ES is, is one really good example. And I, there are more and more startups. The gaming uh, 
there will be gaming, there seems to be a lot of interesting happening on the gaming sector that has been pretty slow. Not just iPhone games, but also like, uh, like more ambitious projects like Demos and a few others with very experienced teams and, 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 and the whole real-time web is getting better. And so I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know what, what has happened, but a lot, lot more is happening. And this is, Finland is starting to get to the radar of like big foreigners, like international VCs and, 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 and angels as well. If I, if I look on the funding side, I, I remember in the beginning of my sites around 2006, it was like, you know, a nightmare to find funding in Finland. Yeah. It's very difficult, you know, like five VCs, pretty much not active, etc. Like nowadays, it's a lot easier. Yeah. So, so can you maybe describe how it is now compared with before, like what wasn't there, what's new, what, what you can do now, this kind of stuff. So in, in terms of like, like in, 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 if I again go back to late 90s, and there was a lot, there were a lot of international investments in Finland, like Battery Ventures invested in More Magic and Raper Fisher Johnson invested in, in First Hop and, 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 and Bobbit got a big investment abroad and so on. So there were a lot of, lot of investments, but then like, I was pretty busy with Jaiku and, 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 and Google, and when I came back, I realized that there are no international like startup investments happening in Finland. Like in last year, I think there were one or two cases where a foreign investor had invested. So I was, I was kind of shocked because of that. And now when we, we raised, uh, our portfolio company, Onkos, raised money from health gap. That was the first biotech investment in Finland since 97. And, 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 and like we, we got the tier one angels to soul fanatics and, 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 and amplifier is probably closing a really interesting round. So things are improving, but I don't know why it has been so extremely slow. And I think that this is, this is the beginning there will be I, I know know about a few other deals that are not related to us that's, that are going to be pretty pretty uh, high profile when they will be published. So what do you think has improved now? I don't know. More experienced teams are looking for money and then young entrepreneurs seem to be more aggressive. They, they're going abroad to, to get funding. The, the execution is better and we, we start to have these more fundable companies, I would say, that they, uh, the ideas are just better and, and, and entrepreneurs are, are better. Like young, but young entrepreneurs slash hackers, I mean, that's sometimes very fundable, fundable team if they have a good idea. All right, question for Temu. Uh, you've started your new startup now. So what have you done different from before? So uh, I wasn't leading Jaiku, but kind of the first employees got, we got the founding team uh, because things really started going on then. Uh, so it's totally different experience and I have learned a lot, like in a hindsight when I look Yuri and Petri, I, I now realize that uh, why they sometimes were difficult different aspects, but when, when you are founder, you, you kind of, uh, you think in a much bigger ways and can we do something totally different. But when you go to work on a startup, you kind of <coughs> imagine that it, this is the direction that we are going, and this is my skill set. But you actually, that's a good point, that if you get employees to try to emphasize that things will change, <laughs> because that you have a natural, Inertia for against the changes usually. Mm -hmm. What about you? What do you do different now with startups? Especially because you're on the other side of the table now, so you probably. Well, I don't know. Are. I don't know. Like we we kind of incubating a few things of our own, so we kind of right. partly entrepreneurs still. But uh, I don't know what would be first. Maybe um, like creating ensuring that everyone shares the same 
values would be really important. And I, I know like Demo has been doing that and like the day with, with his co-founder and, 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 and that's something that we we're doing really 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 ensuring it, it may sound like a soft thing and, and so on like some why, why can't you just execute on the plans and so on but it's really important that you know like what is the are, are we going to make a lot of money here or uh, are we more interested in changing the world and kind of the priorities and how do we work and, and how do we react in different situations? This kind of basic, that, like the corporate culture, you know, it, it needs to be very well defined. Even that, even in a, when, it, when 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 you have this, even a co-founder or second employee or something like that, like from day one, I think that's very very important because if that's not defined very well, and if people come to the company with wrong expectations, then it gets really hard hard later. Not that we had like serious, serious problems on that, but it's still something that like almost all the companies yeah. don't do it properly. I think your post was good about like having big vision. Your blog is one sort of What's your blog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's What's like your blog's address? Serialtrier.wordpress.com. Yeah. But when, like Peter said, when you have kind of big vision, it excites you, it excites people around you to work for you, it excites customers and you know, because if you think that the next five years we will be doing this startup, it should be something that you will be proud if it would be last thing that you do in this life or you know, you don't spend time in stupid things like me. All right. Um, so you and I have been active in this LinkedIn conversation recently. Uh, claiming that Finland is a crap country for startups. Uh, and, and this is in opposition with a lot of like, good vibes that, that have been here lately, you know, and yeah. people saying Finland has been getting better, etc. But you guys started Jaipur when Finland really was a crap country for startups. Yeah, so I, can, I think, you, yeah. I mean, nothing has changed in the environment, but more things are happening now. And, and Finland is starting to get more attention from 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 abroad, so like, uh, you, you, so I've been saying to people who are claiming that this is a crappy country because of taxation, heavy taxation or bureaucracy, or the Tekes is not doing its job, and there are various other other reasons that I think are just in the end like excuses. It, it's as easy to found a company here as as anywhere else. Uh, there, there, would, there is some advantages, like if you found a company in Silicon Valley or New York, but like most of the other places in the world are, Finland doesn't have, Finland is not lacking anything that those places would, and like compared to UK, for example, I think it's much easier to, to, to create a tech startup in Finland than, than in the UK and make it successful. So nothing has changed in the environment, but better things are happening now. So what has changed? So it's actually just the fact that more people like you are founding companies and trying things out, which is one of the just taking risks. And so the biggest change, change is just that the attitudes have, have changed. And I think that they will keep changing. So it, like, think about it, you can just start something here if you don't have high personal costs. Like, I think most of you don't have, like, luxurious lifestyle that takes, you need a 20,000 euro salary to, to survive. So, it's so a monthly or something like that. But you, so, you can st if you start a company here, you can go and get angels from abroad. You can get VC money from abro abroad. And if you have a cool idea and good team, it's the same whether you are in Helsinki or Berlin or London or any other, or Asia. So it's, it's actually, it's just about the attitude and now. It's one of the reasons why I'm here and doing all kinds of things with Alto, yes, is, is to change the attitude, not, I think it's the only thing that needs to be changed. All right, question for you too. Uh, are there any things, uh, that mistakes you made with Jaiku or the ideas that you had, preconceptions that you had that were proven wrong, and you know, 
inside the list that you should have done it, or is that different? So he's done more. Is that, is that why? Uh, I think like th this is really important insight that we started mobile focus, and me and Mika was I and Mika was both mobile focus developers, mm -hmm. and we had the ambitions in mobile, and then we realized that this, this is long path because. It, on that time, you had to go to the operators or Nokia to sell your idea to get it distributed. And the focus was moving more on the web that we should have a cool website. And like, the main action is there, and the mobile is the kind of longer track thing. But of course, our skill set in mobile, so that kind of, if I would be an entrepreneur in China now, I would be doing, I would kind of ditch the mobile for a while and focus on the web with the mm. whole team. On the other hand, without the mobile, the acquisition probably wouldn't have happened because it was still kind of very, very uh, interesting technology, even if it was a team acquisition. So mm. uh, it was like the extra bonus needed for, for, for the team acquisition. So yeah. mm. you difficult thing to balance, but if you want to make a business, you should focus on the something that grows yeah. <laughs> and easy, it's easy to grow. Yeah, I think we, we, we did the right thing by launching really fast and getting into the game with real customers, like having real customers after three weeks, yeah. it's pretty good. And, and then where we made a mistake, and this is a mistake that most of the startups made, is that we, we didn't simplify enough, like we, we thought about implementing new features, so we, pretty soon we had all the features that Twitter had, but also mobile things yeah and then kind of things that channels and yeah channels and kind of things that were not consistent like yeah. we had this different kind of presence on mobile and then this thing on the web band. Yeah. and it, it was harder for the users to understand what the service was about than, yeah. than with Twitter so I would have if I would go back I would simplify it and ensure that it's not like flying below Twitter like yeah. that was we tried to get kind of on the side because Twitter was growing fast and we, it was suffocating us. So we tried to do something, but we should have removed some Twitter-like yeah. features and be as, as simple and small as Twitter, but on some slightly different, yeah. in slightly different position. Why do you think that Twitter was growing faster? Well, we, yeah, of course we know. I mean, we were tracking them pretty well. Like I, I, we tracked everything. But why? Why? I mean. Because of the network, the biggest one was the network effect. Like you saw the demos curves. Like even though, like when we were, when we were growing fast, I think we were growing about the same. Uh, our growth rate was about the same as Twitter's, but then kind of, kind of, Twitter was kind of it, it had the critical mass. So even if, if it had problems, it was a, able to sustain that growth rate. And then when kind of when they when they were able to increase the rate a bit more and they were bigger and bigger, I mean they were accelerating. And then you saw that it, our growth was starting to slow down. So we had a kind of linear growth but it was not viral. And we, we started hearing like many times like our feature set was getting pretty good and the product was getting better. And everyone agreed that it's better than Twitter to nicer to use and more meaningful and so on. But then we started hearing increasingly that what all my friends are in Twitter. Yeah. So even though it's, it's, it's a bad, worst service, I need to be there. That's, that's one thing that you should, in the beginning, measure, measure correct things. Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't actually measure, we measured kind of user acquisitions, or kind of how many users we get, and, and page views, and that kind of thing. But we should have measured all kind of, like, how people actually use it, and can we make it easier to convert from the sign up to, we, we didn't actually do the converse, we, this is now kind of standard, but at that time there was no blog posts about optimizing fun, funeral or something yeah. like that. So we didn't actually track that when they, when you sign up to a child when they drop out, because you probably, every step makes you drop out from that process. Yeah. We started following that. Yeah, but, but too but late. Like, yeah, too late. Yeah. We didn't learn it. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying is that even though you, you, you had a very, very low time to market mm -hmm. and you were able to push features really fast, you still have a problem that, that you didn't build in the beginning the features the, the users wanted. No, I think that we, no, the problem was, was that, that we didn't drop the features. Yeah. Okay. 
And we should have aimed at simpler and simpler yeah. user experience. But you need to have the, this minimum viable product that all of you have heard about here. I think some, somebody th talk about it. So Every day. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's you'll, I think you'll see from Amplify also. also yeah. so, uh, so that's really important thing. Like I would just go out, I mean, launch the minimum viable product that has this one cool core thing implemented really well, but nothing else. And then just expand from that and get to the real customers. Like you should already during this be in touch with, let's say five real customers really, really closely, whether they are businesses or, 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 or consumers. It was actually uh, an example of how harmful like extra features can be because the S60 client was really cool and ahead of time we were very proud of it and we promoted it on the site but when people came to the site from the Twitter or yeah. they, they they kind of okay you need this kind of S60 phone to use this service those, yeah. so this is not for me so it kind of well, even harmful for, for the idea of this service that we promoted it at the point and yeah you, you really need to be able to think like you would be an outsider. What, what if you come to the site? Like, is it really obvious what what's the benefit and what does this do? Uh, the, uh, and recently, there's been a lot of data on the fact that whatever you have there, everything everything like non-core is actually harmful. It's especially harmful in the beginning because, like, if for example this tutorials that are pretty standard that okay take the tour of the service they sometimes pretty harmful because instead they can people take the tutorial and then they get distracted if the only alternative is to sign up or just start using the service it's many times it's just a better better thing so think really carefully what you implement in the beginning that you implement the one thing that the users the thing that the users want and then start from that. You, you had a lot of users and, and a lot of promo in Finland and, and like the core community of Jaco, I think it was mainly in Finland. Uh, well, Finland wasn't, it was I think our third or fourth biggest oh, country, so okay. US was the biggest country. So I had, as, yeah. as a user I had the impression Jaco was mostly for Finns. Yeah, yeah, well that's, the, that's good actually, that, that's a good impression. Yeah. But, but US was bigger and some other countries as well okay but so so why did you have the focus still on promo here and, and, and on users here I think we didn't actually or did you have a focus well, no we, we didn't I mean we didn't do any PR here okay. for example we had a New York based a New York and San Francisco based PR person yeah that was really uh, called Neil Weinberg that who, who was really valuable for for us, and, and we learned a lot about PR, like strategic PR from from him. And he was really good in. What did you learn? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, like, for example, how that a couple of things, like finding how important it is to find stories that stick. Like, think about what kind of stories does your company have? There may be something really great in and funny in, in founding the company or maybe something that has happened or something that your user has done or just invent some. we didn't invent something but I would invent something if, if I wouldn't have anything so uh, that was one important thing because those stories just like circulate and you get attention and bloggers write about them and uh, 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 and so on. I, I've been testing it every now and then with a couple of stories, like just, and it seems to work anywhere. So, and uh, you can practice by writing tweets or hacker news headlines, like what what sticks. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was one thing. The other one was that like you you have a goal, like a strategic goal first. Like our goal was to get more users. And then when we started moving, like the, when we figured out that either we take money or, or we, we, we sell the company. So our goal changed that we need to be more perceived as a Silicon Valley based company. So then we changed our whole PR and we, and, and, and we started looking like what is the, how do we make this a Silicon Valley based company? So, so 
Yuri started, we, we booked and, and Yuri started talking more in, in, in local conferences in the valley and then we arranged a big party there. We invited everyone and the PR guy arranged Robert Scoble to interview us in a hotel room and, and like all kinds of funny things, like tactical things that, that worked pretty well. So it's just like that you really think what you want to aim and then design the strategy around that and make sure you have the right message. So it's, 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 not, it's not doing press releases or these kind of things that traditionally is thought this is PR. It's like creating like a strategic message and stories and then making sure that everyone it's hears. Actually, do you know SoundCloud, Swedish startup? What's the video of one of the SoundCloud founders where he tells about this party that they organized in Berlin and he's even having hangover in the video and, and it's like really great about how to do the kind of grassroots PR and it is, it's funny video and how, how they kind of get the attention, got the attention in music, uh, musician scene by the party. What was it called again? Uh, SoundCloud is the company, I, I, I can post the tweet with the link to the video because it's really funny and great. Yeah. Well, that would be very nice. Uh, yeah. What kind of uh, funding, fundraising advice do you have for these guys, considering where they are and what they should do next? Well, of course, my regular advice is that I keep repeating is that just pitch, pitch to everyone. Like every time you have the opportunity to pitch your project, then just just do it because you get so much better. Hopefully with like somebody else present. So like if you have a co-founder or just just obs that would, would just observe how people react to that pitch. It's usually benefit it's hard to pitch and and observe at the same time. But of course you can do that as well. And and, 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 and and the actions of the other side tell you whether the pitch works or not. But that's very important, and I guess you, you're already doing and arranging both formal pitches, but also like pitches to your friends and, 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 and other entrepreneurs and, and students and whoever you, you see. That's one kind of, that's one advice, because you don't want to go be unprepared when you go to the investors. And then the other one is, just try to get the best resources possible or best best people to help you with the with the pitch like people are usually willing to help like if you go to let's say if you would have a graphic startup then you would probably want to go to Billy Mietin and the ex hybrid guys who work at lots now to to get their feedback and, and connections and just be really a pushy with those you don't have anything to lose so that you get kind of best feedback and best ideas and just then improve the pitch and the presentation. Make it short. It needs to be under 10 slides or 10 or less. So if it's longer, I can say that it sucks already. If, if you have more than 10 slides, you're going to fail. And it sounds like a stupid simplification, but it's, it's just true. I mean, you can't use those in, in like interactive situation that, that nowadays you have with investors. And then Finally, I would say, I would just go try to find the best investors for your company or project at this phase and just go. So re regarding this, that, that was actually my next question. Uh, yeah. When is it, when are you ready to talk to angels? When are you ready to talk to VCs? Should you talk abroad? I mean, I think for angels, you need to, you can go as early as like now, I would say. If you, if you feel so that, that this story is, you're getting good feedback, from Ramine and others here and whoever, I mean, try to get feedback from 10 persons that are similar to potential investors. So even like friendly, friendly angels that can, that can, uh, that are happy to give you feedback and not to kind of, you, you wouldn't lose the opportunity for them to invest in you if the, if the presentation is a bit rough initially. So and then after that, if, you, if when you feel that okay, this story works, then just go, go, go and go and find them and get introductions. It's good even in Finland, but it's vital if you go anywhere 
else. I mean, it's this, uh, you usually find one person that somebody knows always somebody. So you only need, if you know, don't know directly a person, you, you can get to that person via one, one link or at most two links, but usually just one. So just get introductions. That's the, the most efficient way. So, but that's, that covers the angels, but what about when are you ready to talk to the VCs and when should you go broad? Well, most of, most of the, I don't know many companies in Finland that would be really ready to talk to VCs. I, like, like, I would say I would only talk to VCs after having raised angel funding and when the product is really like you. You really have the company going and you need money to accelerate your success or like the, the threshold is, is, is I think much higher today. Like you should get pretty far with Angel and maybe some early seed investor money. And then to really go to real VCs like Index or Balderton or these, I mean it would really require a solid story and, and a real company, not just a, a team doing something. All right. Questions? You had questions for Tim earlier, so you can ask either of them. Yeah. Come on. All right. We have been talking about the competition and competitive intelligence with some of the teams today. I think we knew, we knew almost everything that was happening with Twitter. And we had like, initially there was Twitter and then Chaiku and, and some months after us, Pounce was launched, which was from Kevin Rose, who is from, from Deek, who is very high profile, profile uh, entrepreneur in the Valley. So we, we knew pretty much everything that we had to know about the companies. So I think that wasn't, the, we, we knew the space really well, so when we met investors or anybody else, we were really able, able to profile us, us really well. So I think, I mean, my advice is just that you need to know that, like, it's a real turn off to the investors or anybody, like, who has been around if you don't know the competition. Like, if somebody says that we don't have any competitors and, and so on, and then, like somebody Googles a bit and, and th they found four direct competitors or even indirect ones. So just know the space really well. And, it, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like uh, when we started Chai Cook, when we explained the idea to not, our friends, they said that they would never do this kind of thing, that post some mon mundane posts about their life in a stream. Now that everybody's doing it Facebook, but that, in that time everybody was saying that the stupidest idea that I've ever heard. So, mm -hmm. like Twitter was actually helping to bring the awareness of this kind of microblocking and what Facebook actually later implemented. And mm -hmm. so, uh, if you are doing something really on the edge, it's, it's usually you are working towards the same goal of goal of making awareness of this. Mm -hmm. That's thing. true. So, like we changed, we had these different positionings. We were initially like. Uh, what was the smart address? Uh, what kind of social address book? Social pool. address book, rich presence. Rich presence. Book. Live stream. Yeah. Micro microblogging. And yeah. And we ended with microblogging, like we but tried to find. But we didn't invent it ourselves because the whole yeah whole uh, thing became a microblogging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what did actually Google want from you? What did they get out of you? Because if I remember your site about why you got acquired with the eyeballs and these kind of things, and you said that you were quite a small company for Google. So why did they actually acquire you? No, I team. think team, team acquisition clearly. Right. So the mobile tech helped kind of prove a bit of the team and, and Yuri's and Petter's background. Like Yuri was very well known in social media space. So, so team with, with a bit of boost from tech and, and the mm. background. Yeah. 
and some things like we shared the big vision with Google yeah. and so on. So that there were some good matches. Yeah. I think we like the first call that we got from Google was like a couple of weeks after our launch. That was just like that we were on the radar and then we heard about them like a year later or something like that. But yeah. it's uh, yeah, we went there once once in the spring that we didn't know why. We thought that they wanted to make some cooperation with us. Yeah, yeah. They just talked with us and I was like, what was that? How did you go to about the before we jumped in but the one no. story one story is that Yuri had left Nokia of the company with Petri and you had to pit different angle in the like in, in the idea level first yeah but then Yuri had dreamed about this social address book and had made the mock-ups and so on and he actually presented in the reboot conference and Mika was in the audience and went after presentation that I have already done that, you know, that part of the PhD. And that's why the mobile focus and social address book focus started in the beginning. And then we started, uh, slowly realized that we have to be more on the web. And probably Yuri had mm. thought about those ideas that we have in the web a lot, lot yeah. before. So yeah. you have all this, like we had tons of ideas, like calendar sharing and, you know, that events and like Facebook has lots of, but, and, and that was the, one of the problems that you have lots of ambitions and either ideas and everybody is that this is what we will do and this will be the greatest thing and kind of how the simple thing comes out of that, I don't know, it's a difficult process. Why, why did we end up in, with microblogging is that like the category started emerging, like the yeah. New York Times and, and others were to started talking about microblogging, so we just thought about that it's 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 very good to be part of a Trend. space and that's growing rapidly and becoming really important so if you, if you would like that even the number two player there so it's totally different than if you're doing some your own category that nobody has validated like it's really easy to define a category that's you are the, like the best in the world but it's, if it's not significant then like nobody gets interested. But if you're number two in a category, we, can, we had a story for everyone that this is actually going to kind of disrupt the uh, blogging. And, and yeah. Yuri had a really nice analogy on that and that, that we used, used and so on. So that was a really good story. And then we say what we are the microblogging, mobile microblogging company. It was clear to everyone, early adapters and investors and everyone that it was clear what we do. Was it difficult for you guys to adapt to working in uh, Silicon Valley and London? Or what, what, were there major differences? Uh, maybe it was like big company, small company shift that happened. Because before that we were kind of in constant, like we used the site and promoted the site and it was very personal. Like there was Andy, one of our front end web developers, were sending pictures when he had his eye, black eye after some Python conference and you know, like like crazy stuff, we were really living that space, yeah. you know. And when you go to big company, you cannot, and especially Google, Google is very open inside and that's why it has to be closed outside. outside. You, you, don't, you cannot tell too much outside. And that was really difficult for us because we were, before that we were kind of living and telling everything in the service, so. Yeah, I think that's like, I, I think I, I did maybe a two public like talks while at Google just because it was so difficult to yeah. and and it I could because we know we knew so much we we were it was like totally impossible to 
figure out like what can be said and what's public knowledge and what isn't. So it's just easier to not to say anything. Yeah, and I, I made the PR mistake <laughs> there, which is very famous, and, and like say say too much about like what we our plan for Jai at that time and yeah. Finnish press picked it up and I learned a lot about press <laughs> yeah. making mistakes. Yeah. <coughs> Alright, now that you see that uh, Google has used a lot of your ideas I think for Buzz and there's the Google Me or whatever that they want to push or something, I don't know, the uh, theory Facebook thing. What, what do you think? Uh, I mean, do you think it's possible to have an, an impact in like large corporations like this when you're when you're a startup? Or yeah, I have to say first that we don't know anything about like what what are Google's plan or not. Not what I, I I don't know. It's it's hard to say whether Google is kind of an execution company. I think first and foremost, like this, the teams don't have weak links like. Like in, in a sense that in a normal company you uh, tend to have people that you can trust and, and a like small percentage of people do all the important work. But Google is kind of an execution machine where everyone is pretty well pre-screened and, and, and efficient so kind of it just keeps executing. So like social has been really difficult but if Google really wants there, I think eventually they will do something important there. Like it, it, it's just like a train that that goes forward. Even like yeah. compared to innovation, I think it's even more, even better in execution than innovation. Like innovations are, tend to come outside, it's already so big. Like most of the innovations are acquisitions, but the execution just works really well if you consider how how big the company is. Yeah. yeah, it's quite unique. All right, do we have one more question or? Rudy. Okay, what do you guys think about Tekes and Tekes money? Good, bad? <laughs> I think well, we are, we're dealing a lot with Tekes. So, like, if, if you are an entrepreneur, you should take all the money that you get if the conditions are good. So take as money is a tool, tool and, 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 and like a advantage for Finnish startup because in Silicon Valley there's no tech, so it, it's a, like leveling the playing field a bit. So it's just spend a couple of days filling the forms and and and, and, and that's it. So it's it's pretty and if you don't get it, don't don't become a kind of jealous or stop too much blaming because it's kind of wasted energy in a sense that things change very slowly and leave it. If you're running a company, leave it to some others to change the kind of the general processes there. Like we did, we get some little money from from Kex into Santia, which is kind of you should also think about that. It's part of the same governmental ecosystem, so. Uh, don't plan for a ticket money, but if you can get it, take it. Yeah, I, I agree. It's like a bonus for being finished. <laughs> um, at which phase you, you think a startup start, should start uh, attracting and uh, getting involved with people in their, in their board? And how to, to attract them? Yeah, so the board itself is not that. If you if you met, if you refer to the formal board of directors, I think it's not very important in a startup. Like you should have one person there that that knows how to run a board, like that is legally done in a proper way. But otherwise, like whether they are board members or just external advisors, I think you should uh, you should aim at getting them really fast and and. The best way of getting them is to get them as angel, these people as angel investors. If you have some top talent that that's not kind of that, for example, doesn't do a, that don't do angel investments, then you could consider options or ownership or something like small incentives, incentives for them. But I would do it as early as possible, especially since you, in general you are relatively young. 
So like with, with, with some really solid advisors who already have connections, you are just filling some or checking some very important boxes. So you suddenly you have connections, you have some validation, you have experience and so on. So they're very important. So from, again, when the story starts working, then approach them or even earlier these friendly, friendly advisors. So I wouldn't wait for a launch or something like that as early as possible. All right, time is up. So thanks both okay. of you for your time. Thanks.